This Week in Startups is brought to you by Citrix GoToMeeting. Meeting is believing. Visit gotomeeting.com. Click the Try It Free button and sign up for a 30-day trial. And Envision. Find out why so many hot startups are using Envision to prototype, present, and collaborate on design in real time. Sign up for a 90-day free trial today at envisionapp.com twist. Today, Jason looks at the future of transportation with Joe Bertman of Uber, Case Coolin of EQT Ventures, Nicholas Ostberg of Delivery Hero, and Peter Carlson of Tesla Motors with Tyler Crowley at the Stockholm Tech Fest. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. All right, so let me just introduce the guests. We have Joe Bertman, Bertrim, sorry. Now you're with Uber. Yep. This is a fantastic company. Absolutely. Um, the PR people were very concerned about the questions I'd ask. And then I told them I was the third investor in the company. My first question is, could this service be any more perfect? <laughs> uh, but I'll ask you some tough questions in a minute. Now, Nicholas, you um, obviously are the uh, CEO and co-founder of Delivery Hero, over a billion dollars invested, operating in 34 countries. 3,000 employees? Um, office workers, around 3,000, yeah. And then, then how many people drivers. are actually running packages around these? Oh, that's forces? a lot. I, I don't know. Um, don't know. I, I don't know. It's, it's still a small portion. Most of the delivery is done by the rest of the south. We start more and more, so probably a few thousand also. Of, of, Got it. But it's probably 100% per month. Got increase. it. Uh, and Peter Carlson, obviously, Chief Product Officer and Supply Chain at Tesla Motors. Yes. Uh, uh, so... Uh, Peter, let's start with you with Tesla. You joined Tesla before the Model S was delivered. And I know the Model S being delivered was probably one of the more Herculean tasks ever created in the history of startups. How close was that company to failure at that time when you joined? I know it was very difficult to get that product. And did you believe it was going to get to market? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, but, but I must tell you, the, the 15 months leading up to, to the launch, which was actually on Midsummer Eve on 2012, uh, was, was brutal. It was the worst, worst in my life um, by far. Uh, we were burning about $100 million per quarter, um, and we were seeing that, you know, that date just had to be there. Uh, or June of 2012 is when Elon said he would, had delivered the first car. Exactly. Exactly. And then when we did uh, about a month prior to launch, when we did a whole bunch of crash, crash tests of the vehicles, uh, we realized that uh, there was a whole bunch of things we needed to adjust. And to do that in 30 days uh, was, we did some crazy shit. <laughs> um, how rewarding is it now? Um, how rewarding is it now? Consumer Reports just came out with their updated review of the P85D. They gave it the highest rating in the history. My drummer is uh, nodding. He's like, yeah, I got, <laughs> like, I got yep. the P85D. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this shit's dope. Um, I thought you are from New York. You're from New York? Yeah. Um, and so um, it gave it the highest score ever. Uh, and then the last car... They also gave it the highest score ever. When you look back on it, what did you think the public reaction was going to be to the car? Did you know it was that good? We, I think uh, the people who worked close to the, to the vehicle just felt um, that it's, uh, you know, this is going to be a big game changer. But um, we had to convince a lot of other people. The, the, you know, the, the official um, prognosis institute of the automotive industry, IHS, they thought we would sell 3,000 vehicles over its life cycle. Uh, and uh, a whole bunch of suppliers and other stakeholders were looking at those numbers and were clearly questioning when we wanted them to drive something totally different. And now we are running basically somewhere between 1,000 to 1,200 per week. Wow. Pretty amazing. There seemed to be a contingent of people Negative people, critics, haters, 
trolls who seem to latch onto this company and want to see it fail so greatly. Who, who are these people, and, and <laughs> why do you think they, that Tesla irked them so much? It was a small contingent, but very vocal, including a New York Times columnist and a New York Times reviewer who fudged the numbers on the actual review. A New York Times critic wanted to paint Tesla in such a bad light that they changed facts, and they were spanked by the public editor of the New York Times. Who are these people, and what is their hate of the car company that has done so much to move society forward and perhaps save the planet from you know, this, this carbon issues and leading the way? <laughs> it's a really, really difficult question to say. Um, what, what I can say is, you know, it's clearly so that we are polarizing um, our audience. I think we have probably the most dedicated owners and, and um, also stakeholders. Uh, but uh, just as we say, there is a whole bunch of people that um, also loves to find any flaw in, in what we're doing. And I, I can't really say why, why we're creating so much emotions. What did you guys think when you saw that New York Times writer fudge the numbers? Because you had the internal data. Elon had the data of where the car had gone. And the journalist changed the numbers on it. A New York Times journalist, in fact and said that they drove uh, more miles, less miles than they actually did. When you saw that data, when somebody came to Elon or to you and said, look, the data says X, and he said Y, what was that moment like? Where were you when you found out that he had fudged the data? Well, um, and, you know, when, when this happened, of course, we immediately went back to, uh, to the core data and, and looked what, what actually happened. And, um, and then, you know, there was a... Um, there was a decision whether, uh, you know, whether you would meet this up front in, in an argument, which you know, most people are recommending you not to do. The PR people. The PR people. The PR people um, who have no guts yeah. <laughs> advise, um, don't start a fight with the New York yeah. Times. But of course, um, Elon and our co-founder, J.B. Straubel, sat down and, and they were basically writing the blog, explaining exactly how it went. and. Uh, you know, became a big fuss, but I think in the end, I think it turned out uh, in a very well way. Journalism sometimes seems a little out of control. They feel like they can write whatever they want. Facts be damned. You have to be very careful what okay. you say. It's crazy, <laughs> yeah, isn't it? Yes. It makes <laughs> me so angry that a New York Times journalist would try to stop a company doing such great things in the world. Thanks. Yeah. Go ahead. But there's a question. There, there's yeah. people who hate Uber as well. No. There are. There's never been. I've never heard a complaint. In fact, I think nobody's really, that star rating, it's never gone below four. You can confirm this, correct, Joe? The driver's rating or yours? The driver's rating. My rating, my rating you know, I, I figured out how to fix my rating. Because I was, um, I take a long time to get, you know, I call the car, it's outside. I take a long time to get outside. Sometimes. I'm late, you know? Um, so... Uber drivers technically are not supposed to start the meter until you get in the car, correct? So I created a little shortcut on my phone. When I type UUU for Uber, it expands and it says, I'm very sorry, I'm, I'm gonna be a moment. Please, please, please start the meter. And since I did that, I'm all five stars. Ah, that's a clever hack. Hey, everybody, let me take a moment to thank our friends at Citrix GoToMeeting. I mean, gosh, think about all the time and money and hassle it takes to hold these meetings. My God, you're going down to the valley, up to San Francisco, uh, the traffic, the cost, the flying places. And my recommendation is that you meet your clients and coworkers over Citrix's GoToMeeting. It is a smarter way to meet, and it has beautiful HD faces amazing HD quality. I just did an all hands with my uh, team from inside.com and it was perfect. Everybody had crystal clear VoIP or they were dialing in and people were on different platforms. Some people were on their smartphones, some people were on tablets, some people were on desktop computers. And you know what? I have a real thing. I want everybody to have like a headset on and some people forgot their headsets and it still sounded really good. Uh, it's really the most professional uh, meeting project product on the market. It's very affordable. I've had it for many, many years. I think I'm close to a decade using GoToMeeting. 
And I want you to try it and sign up for GoToMeeting today. You'll get it free for 30 days. You have nothing to lose. So visit GoToMeeting.com, click the Try It Free button. And if you do it now, uh, your first meeting will be up and running uh, in just minutes. And that's GoToMeeting, and uh, your first 30 days are free. It's a fantastic product. You can also, it has a chat room in it, which is also a nice feature. Uh, I like to have somebody take notes and put it in the chat room. You can also record the audio from it in case you want to share that with everybody. And you know what? I do that as well. It's a fantastic product. Thank you, GoToMeeting. Let's get back to this amazing episode. Let's talk a little bit about Uber. Um, it, it seems like some cities embrace the service and... Um, just absolutely cherish it, the users love it. And then there seem to be some cities which fight it tooth and nail. Is there some trend between these two um, contingents of, 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 of cities? Because it's, it seems to be a city by city, not even a country by country. It's a city by city, basically a war sometimes, or it's a victory parade. Sometimes you march into a city and they love it, they appreciate it. What's the difference between those two types of cities? Is there a pattern? I think we actually see the same trend in almost all the cities. It's just they're at different stages. So even in the US, when we first introduced ride sharing, there were many, um, many of the incumbents who found it difficult. And while the riders and drivers loved it, there were a lot of the incumbents fighting big wars against Uber. Now we're, we have legalized ride sharing across most of the states of the US. Now in Europe, we're, we're a bit further behind. We're much newer. We only launched most of the cities in the last year or so. And we're seeing huge support from, from riders. Many of the drivers are earning a better living, but obviously we're disrupting an industry that, that hasn't been disrupted for a long time. And, that, and it's also a very politically connected industry. So that, that does cause some, some friction. Got it. And so when you see what happened in Paris, this seems to be very present in people's minds. I mean, cars were being turned over. Um, when we saw this in the United States, we, we couldn't believe what we were seeing. I mean, being an Uber investor or not, any company being faced or any service being faced with this level of resistance, um, what do you think that represents ultimately for the city of Paris that, and for those companies? Why are they fighting so hard? And why aren't they maybe adopting the tactics? You know, it seems to me that adopting the best practices of Uber would be a more effective strategy than turning over cars and burning them and holding Uber passengers hostage. Of course. I mean, violence is, is never the answer. And we obviously were all shocked by what, what happened in Paris. I do think it's also important to remember that um, technology and Uber's representing technology in the transportation area is disruptive and it impacts people's livelihoods. And transportation isn't the first place where that's, that's come. But the taxi drivers and, and the incumbents that are protesting, they're, they're worried for their livelihood. And of course, it would be better to adapt and compete on quality and, and, and cost, but they're also mostly individual operators. So finding the way that they can get together and build an app or improve their quality of service can be harder for them. And one of the things I find confusing is when you look at Uber and Lyft um, and other people in the services, none of them are requiring that the drivers be loyal to that platform. Nobody's asking for an exclusive. So in fact, anyone who's driving for Uber can leave at any time. Is that correct? Absolutely, and, and that's one of the value propositions for Uber. Um, obviously, it makes it harder to retain our drivers. It means that we actually have to make sure we're giving them the best possible economic opportunities and support. But it also makes it easier for, for us to get people to try it out. You don't have to commit to anything. You don't have to leave whatever other company you're driving with. You just come and, and drive for a few hours, see if you like it. You find you earn more. You find the, the riders are friendly, and, and you stay. I mean, that seems to be the thing, Case, that people are missing in all of this with Uber, is that the, even when you hear some resistance from certain drivers uh, or just certain constitu constituents um, or parties involved in this whole um, disrupted industry, the drivers can have ultimate freedom and choice. Correct case? And uh, yes, the driver can decide themselves uh, when they want to work, how much they want to work. Uh, and it's a big freedom. And we, there's a lot of discussion going around, like you said, in the press. Uh, it's always uh, highlighting the negative aspects, but we have a huge amount of drivers that are very happy to work with us because some housewives, for example, they can work now in the hours that the children are at school, where otherwise they could not take a job. So there's a lot of positive things. There, there. are a lot of stay-at-home parents who will work, they'll drop their kids off, go work for a little bit and then keep going. Exactly. 
Great. Let's, um, you have something to add to that, Joe, about the sort of choice? No, I, the only thing I was going to add was um, it's, it's not only peer-to-peer. -peer. In many of the markets in, in Stockholm here and also in London, we also offer a license service where existing taxis and, and private hire drivers can use the app to, to earn some extra money. So black taxis in London, for example, um, taxis here in Stockholm can work on the app to, to earn extra money. Got it. Hey, um, you've been sitting here so patiently. Let's talk a little bit about Delivery Hero. What, what company is Delivery Hero most like in the United States, would you say? Grubhub, or is it more like um, a Sprig or Spoon Rocket? <coughs> You're not delivering your own food. No, we're not delivering our own. So it's probably more like the Grubhub, although we, we go in the direction of Postmates, uh, where we also want to be uh, delivering, or, or DoorDash probably, right. uh, where we also start delivering our own food to make sure we get the quality, the time, the, the, the delivery, uh, delivery uh, assurance, and so on. Um, and you're operating this business at scale. You've raised over a billion dollars. Obviously not profitable if you're going at this level. Maybe profitable on a unit economic basis, but not you're, invest, you're in investing mode, correct? Yes, correct. The critique I hear about this delivery, um, unlike, say, Uber, where they're taking about 20%, I believe, of every ride, um, is that your business is a much lower margin. You guys make, on average, 10%, correct? Yeah, Half the like amount that. of an Uber or a Lyft? Yeah, something like that. 10, 12, something. And... Who do you charge this 10% to, this 12% to? Who pays, the customer so or the restaurant? We, we always want to make sure that the customer is not getting worse off. They should always be better off. So therefore, all the cost goes to the restaurant. We are delivering the, the, the customer to them. The customers are always better off. They get it faster and all that. Um, so the restaurant has to take a 10% hit on delivering the food. These average order sizes are maybe $30 US or $25 US, I'm guessing? It d depends on market, obviously. Uh, so some markets being anything from 8 euros to, to 30 euros. Um, so. How hard is it to run a business like this? I mean, you have half the margin of an Uber or Lyft, and you have to deal with restaurants, and you have a fragmented market of many different restaurants, um, and the order size is low. This seems to be one of the most operationally challenging businesses that exists today. I do think, or at least the way we want to get profitable is through scale. So that's why I've also been very aggressive. I raised all capital, went to a lot of markets so that we can build that scale. And that's the only way that we can get profitable is to have that scale and, and uh, optimize on every single aspect of it. So everything needs to be completely optimized. And, and uh, we have to also give the value to the restaurant beyond giving customers. We give them POS systems. We make sure that we have the data so we can say which restaurant is better, which one is delivering faster, which one will be slower. So we try to add as much value as we can in the value chain, and, and for that we charge a fee. And, and It's a small fee, but with scale it works. Now, I'll give you the two criticisms I hear of your business. Let me hear your answers to them. Um, by the way, we're going to be very gentle with the panelists during the program today. We're not going to ask any hard questions, but um, no, we're going to go right to the hard questions. Um, the restaurants, what I hear is the difficult challenge is that if a restaurant is doing well, they have plenty of orders, they're sold out most nights, they're the most desirable restaurant, they don't need more customers, therefore, and they also don't want to give up this 12% to you. Therefore, there's a negative signaling that you get the three-star restaurants, the two-star, the three-and-a-half-star, but it's challenging to get the four- and five-star restaurants. Is that criticism actually exist in the real world, or do all restaurants want more customers and all restaurants are willing to pay the 12%? It's reasonable. I... I to, uh, we, we are getting the best restaurant on the platform, and that's very important for us. So we make sure we do whatever it takes to get them there. And I think so you'll charge them less? Um, a less fee to negotiate? We, we, we make sure that we add more value to them to get them on the platform. So you have um, a kickback or something? Uh, not necessarily financially, but, but I think most restaurants actually value the service. And for them, huh. it's also very expensive to take phone orders, to have to uh, employ people for, for taking calls and so on. There, there's less failure rates. We're helping them with delivery fleet management and so on. So, so most restaurants actually see a lot of value beyond just getting the customer. And I think, I think the very good restaurant, what they usually do is that they, they, they probably increase the price at some point to, to meet demand and supply. So I don't ah. think necessarily that the best restaurant is probably more the one who really want to go for scale and cost and discounts and so on, which are the one having too many orders. And we try to balance that because we don't think that's the right because it, it just means that it takes longer to deliver. It means uh, lower quality, lower service. So I think we try to balance and make sure. Okay, and then the second most challenging thing, um, there's a discussion in the United States at least that copies companies like Sprig, Spoon Rocket, Bento, I'm an investor in, um, that are building the full stack. In other words, they're preparing meals for delivery. 
They're putting the meals in the car, in a hot bag, in a cold bag, and then in Bento's case, assembling it at the location so you can actually pick your side orders or whatever. These companies have gotten rid of, or are using a central kitchen, they've gotten rid of all staffing, and they've taken out 20 or 30% of the cost structure and their full stack. And they deliver in half the amount of time it takes you to deliver, or maybe a third or a quarter of the time. Do you see those businesses as a threat? Will you go into that business line? <clears throat> I think it's a good extension of it. I think um, most people still value the individual restaurant and their favorite the local Chinese or the favorite local Thai sure. restaurant and so on. I think that's what most people look for. I also think that in the end, they might be able to deliver faster, but that's because we are not good enough. Uh, we should be able to deliver almost as fast. Of course, if you already have... Yeah, but how, wait, wait, that's around, not true. That's if, not true because... If, they have the food in the car already. Exactly. So, so they're taking 20 minutes out of the delivery. Cycle. That's true. So we can never be maybe asked, maybe we can be five minutes slower than them, but then at least it will be know, just cooked right now. So it will Got not it. be heated in the car and so on. So, that's a fair point. So, so you're trading the five minutes versus... For fresh. Uh, for fresh. Uh, so that's what we want to be, that we want to deliver. But I think, I think it's a good extension. I like the fact that some of them are going into it because sometimes you just want to have food super fast and you don't really care. So will you do um, that under your own brand? I think... We want to be the player that delivers food and be in that space. However, that, that Are one, you testing it sure. yet? No, we haven't. Uh, you sure? Because there was a big pause um, there. Uh, I yeah, think you should have... tell if somebody's lying. <laughs> You're testing this secretly in a market? Uh, we, we have considered and we have talked to players doing it. Um, okay. And I think so we, you're we looking at it heavily? Uh, we have looked at it heavily, so I'm not sure. You, I, have I to, you have to be in this business, correct? We, the way we see it is that we want to own the space. Uh, we want to be the best place. When you're hungry, you want to have something to deliver fast. And of course, this is very fast. Right. Uh, so this, this is going so into our you, territory. Yeah. yeah, so you had this tremendous success in 34 cities, but Uber is in three countries. Countries, sorry. Um, so 100 cities, I don't know, 200 cities. But Uber has this you know, huge logistical um, you know, uh, infrastructure. Um, on a global basis, and they recently in San Francisco made food a tab on the actual top of the app. You must have noticed this. Um, Joe, make your best argument uh, you know, as to why Uber will own this market. I think the, the premise behind it in, in the US where, where we're testing this is to get you a good meal within five or eight minutes. So because we use the existing cars that are already on the road and then have a curated simple choice of, of menu options, that means that you can order and actually have the car that's already you know, only 10 minutes around the corner can come and deliver it to you. Yeah. But obviously there's a trade-off there between the, the choice that you can have and the um, time that you get it in. Got it. How many cities do you know off the top of your head is Uber doing food? I, I don't know. I have no, actually have no information on the company. Uh, even I think it's around five or six in, in the U.S. and in uh, Spain. And in Spain. It, really, it started in Los Angeles, yeah? It's yes, a, well, yeah, exactly. Our, my buddy William, who kicked that off, the Uber Eats. Yeah, Uber Eats. Yeah. Um, but the, it's not only just Delivery Hero and Uber. Who have, isn't there, is there some potential conflict? Like, just looking at the future of transportation as a theme. Right. Between... The self-driving car thing that's coming, that's an inevitable life-changing thing for all of us, right? I mean, Tesla's leading this probably more than any company on Earth right now. Well, uh, I don't know if Tesla's leading. I mean, Uber has 50 employees on the project, and doesn't Google have a but huge they have, project, that's not, But nobody knows. That's very not, well, that's not I mean, public, is it? I mean, and um, Google's leading, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but I mean, already today, every car that is being produced in Fremont uh, has already uh, the capability of driving on its own. Hey everybody, let me tell you a little bit about Envision app. I use Envision app all the time with my designer, my product manager, my growth team to share mock-ups of our products. We take those mock-ups and we design them and we send them to clients, to partners, to investors. And we say, here is an Envision link. Open this on your iPhone, on your Android phone, and you can click through and see what this product that we're making is like. And when we're building websites, hey, put your comments on there. We have a partner. We have a big Smart Camp thing going on with IBM, Smart Camp 2015. You know, we can use Envision to share that website and say, hey, is there anything you want to change? And then have a threaded discussion. You can take all those discussions off of email, all those discussions out of the chat room. Listen, email and chat rooms have their place, but not in product design. Envision is like Slack, but for product design, right? So you have Slack for a general conversation. You have Gmail for, you know, asynchronous communication. You have Envision for product design excellence. You cannot make a great product without Envision. I am 
dead serious about that. Every startup I invest in, I show it to them. They ask them to send me links, and boy, does it work. It supercharges everything you do. I love this product. I love this product. I love this product. Get out of email. Get out of chat rooms. And do what Twitter, Airbnb, Evernote, Adobe, and many more are doing. Prototype um, what you're doing in Envision. It just makes designers and teams and founders so, so, so much more efficient. Go to envisionapp.com slash twist for 90 days free. That's their starter plan, free for 90 days, only at envisionapp.com slash twist, envisionapp.com slash twist. And everybody thank Envision App on Twitter. I thank them for making a great product and for supporting independent media like this week in startups. Let's get back to this amazing episode. Percentage is enabled you know, based on this technology package, oh, would that, you say that's, that's, a, that's a really that's a really really difficult question. But yeah. but what you're going to see as a, as a customer is, you know, when you have this hardware, we're going to enable more and more features based on it. It cannot be entirely autonomous because autonomous for an autonomous car, you need even more sensors, and you need dual systems. So if one system goes down, you need a second system. Mm. But that's not far away. And this is the way. Oh, it's not far away. Interesting. No. So we know that Elon is very serious about this because I remember maybe 18 months ago, 24 months ago, he tweeted. And it's pretty funny because when I first showed him Twitter, he laughed at it. Now he seems to be pretty good at it. But he tweeted, um, we're looking for people to do self-driving cars. You will report to me directly, email me, and put his email. Was this effective? Um, it, well, I, we've built up a, a pretty significant um, team um, around this, um, but it is, a, it, it is a big challenge because uh, once you have, you know, you have a, a whole um, suite of sensor arch architecture that you need, to, um, you need to be able to read everything around you. Um, and, and, but then you have the second piece, and that's the logic. Okay, so how do the car act upon all these different ah, uh, information? The rule set. The, the rule set, um, and this is going to be a, a big item as we go into autonomous driving, because the rule set is also potentially going to push liabilities. You know, from we know today that that users are making mistakes and accidents happen. In the future, you know, it's actually going to be a machine with logic that is driving that vehicle, and there's still it's going to be significantly safer. Okay, so let me ask you a question then yeah. about this logic. Let's say cars going, the speed limit, 55 miles an hour down a road, a highway. And it's a two-lane highway. And um, a bunch of kids run into the road. So you got two or three kids in this lane. And in this lane, there's a tractor trailer. That has to stop, slams on the brakes. What does the computer do? Who does it hit? That's... that's that's um, the absolutely big questions that um, um, you know the industry needs to deal with. Um, and in the same in the same sense, if if an accident is you know unavoidable, do you steer your car into a small Fiat or into a safe Volvo, which could have very different outcomes of of an accident? That is fascinating. So when you think about it, in fact. We, even if it's not, because all the accidents that have occurred with the Google cars, now we're starting to see the data. In almost every case, it's a human is driving into the back of a self-driving car because they're yes. texting. It's like 99 out of 100 cases. Um, so in this case, what percentage do you think ultimately, in your opinion, not speaking for the company, but just in your opinion, what percentage of deaths on the road, what percentage of accidents on the road, 10 years, ago, 10 years from now, will this technology uh, avoid? Could it avoid 90% of accidents, 50%? You know, if, this is my absolutely personal opinion. Yes. But, I, but I think, you know, I think level of accidents could go down to a tenth of what, what it is today. Uh, so the, the idea of dying from a car accident by the time we're all, you know, uh, ready to die from old age, it's going to be like the equivalent of dying from, you know, some disease we've eradicated. In all I mean, good. it might happen in our lifetime, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's a pretty fantastic thing. I mean, as an engineer and, and for the people working there, this is a big part of the motivation, is it not? It is. Saving absolutely. lives. Absolutely. It's, um, you know, 
and I think it's going to be driving a huge transition, you know, for for us, uh, but also for um, you know uh, our society. Um, if you take um, there are several states in, in the U.S. right now where being a chauffeur is the most common uh, um, uh, labor role. Um, so it, it could, you know, the day when, when that role is being replaced by, um, uh, by computers and, and sensors and, and uh, the self-driving car, it will mean some pretty significant changes to, to those societies. Case, when do you think... You're monitoring all this, not speaking as an Uber investor, but speaking as Case Colin, somebody we all respect for his insights and his entrepreneurial acumen. When do you think we'll see these self-driving cars on the road? Because most people thought 10 years ago, but it seems to be moving slightly faster than a 10-year window. What do you think, Case? I think it will go very fast. Um, if you start uh, reading articles about it and you see already cars and there's a lot of research going on and four technology companies start to compete about who will be the real first. Uh, you see a lot of legislation happening uh, in many states, but also like London is working on it to allow this kind of techniques. It means, you know, those companies are already reaching out to the government. I don't think we are that far from it, but it will take long before it's widely adopted. Like the internet, you know, the end of the 70s, we knew what was going to happen. We, I was still a small kid, and in the 90s, we all started, and then the hype came because everybody thought this will happen in a few years. The things that people expected in the mid-90s are happening now. It's 20 years later. So right. I think the same will happen here. We will see them, to my opinion, quite early on the street, not that far from now, but it will take very long before it's widely adopted and used. And, and then this time, people always underestimate. You know, the, the things also to build companies takes many, many years. And Joe, Uber's position is there is a major research project going on with this, um, but the drivers are going to be with us for some time to come. And I think even Elon's position at Tesla, I've talked talk to him about it, is he believes that the autopilot with the ability to disengage is going to be maximum optimization in our lifetime probably. Do you agree with that, Joe? Yeah, probably. I mean, we, we obviously want to, to invest in this area as, as one of the, the forefront of technology, but like Case is saying, it's probably a long time before um, you don't need drivers at all in, in the vehicles. And even when you talk about the more diverse products we have, if we talk about food delivery, for example, it's much harder to deliver that autonomously if the, the driver needs to come in and deliver it. So it would be quite easy for us to make it an option in the app, but I would have thought it's a long time before it's, it's the only option. Let's talk a little bit about safety, Joe. Um, you know, Uber's doing a large number of rides today. Uh, you can fill us in on exactly what the number is. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I just know what I read in the press. Um, but safety comes up in the transportation business. It seems to me that when people talk about safety, when you compare an, an Uber or a Lyft or any of these ride-sharing services to a generic taxi, there's a magnitude more safety in the ride-sharing services because the driver, we know who the driver is, and they're being tracked every minute of every ride, in fact, every second of every ride. And Uber has put in the ability to share your location with loved ones now. Um, do you think Uber gets an unfair rap as being unsafe sometimes when just built into the system is a, is a, is a higher level of safety? We do believe that, that we're one of the safest options in, in almost all of the cities, but, but equally, um, safety is something that you can never be too good at, so we're, we're always working on improving that. It's very challenging to, to get the data to, to compare and, and prove that, um, that the, the accidents are, are higher in, in taxis, because t traditionally it's a very fragmented market and it's quite hard to get the, the data on. One of the great things about Uber is we do have all of that data. We ask for the customer for feedback after every single trip, so we know exactly how many customers Customers have even complained that you know maybe the driving was a bit uncomfortable or that the the driver was rude, and we start to be able to get get in front of those issues before they happen. A creepy driver is going to be eliminated from the system relatively quickly on Uber, and never in a taxi. It, it, well, I don't know in taxi, but on, on Uber, well, I can absolutely. tell you, I'm from New York. I mean, there are taxi I mean, a taxi driver in New York in the 80s or 90s, like the overwhelming majority were great, hardworking people, but the ones who were bad, the only repercussion you had was to be one of the crazy people who wrote a letter and then, you know, like, who's going to write a letter? At what point does somebody get their account suspended and they're no longer allowed to take calls from the network? I've heard it's under 
four stars. Is that correct? It, it varies market by market. Um, people give ratings in different ways here in Europe than in the US, so we sort of calibrate it in each market. Um, but Explain that. So, um, I mean, I think uh, Europeans are generally a bit more stingy with giving the five stars. Um, it varies. So, average ratings... So, it's uh, similar to tipping. Yes, <laughs> probably. <laughs> a little bit of a joke, was that? But there's two ways... Uh, I gave a tip last night. The, the owner hugged me at the restaurant. He's like, You're nobody's ever used that line on the form. Yeah, I think we're more stingy with the ratings. But if a, a driver falls below the required rating in, in, in that market, or if there's a very serious incident, um, then, of course, they, they wouldn't be able to use the, the platform anymore. Um, and how, are you, how do you make sure you're fair to people about this? Because accidents do happen. And, you know, I had one Uber driver who made three mistakes in one call. And he got lost twice. He was a new driver. And then he almost got in an accident. Um, and it was his second day. And he literally followed me into the restaurant and begged me. He, would, he had $40 in cash. He said, I'll pay you double the... Um, amount of your ride, please do not give me a low rating. I know I messed up. And I took my phone out and I gave him five stars and I said, don't worry about it. I believe you. You know, um, How forgiving are you? And, and is there an appeals process where somebody who feels disgruntled or maybe they got an unfair shake can, can get back in your good graces? Um, uh, we see it as we have two sets of customers, the drivers and, and the riders, and so we absolutely need to be as fair as possible. If we get the re reputation for not being fair, then drivers also won't want to, to use the platform. Um, so it varies market by market, but yeah, we, we review each case, talk to the rider and the driver, and, and make a call case by case. I have to make a soft announcement. Soft announcement. Soft announcement is this. We have two startups we're going to present now. Incredible. On this theme of... Transportation. Transportation. On-demand economy. There's something else, uh, an announcement I meant to make at the beginning, which is you and I being Americans, Americans. we do things a little different than the Swedes do. Slightly different, like the tipping. With, we, like the tipping is a great example. Um, one thing that we do is when we, when we need to go somewhere and we're in an event like this, we stand up and we go. Right. Yes, Swedes don't tend to do that. Okay. Like everyone who's leaving right now feels like, oh my God, I'm bothering them. And I'm well, leaving. there's another panel going there's on. There's another panel that starts at 10, which is right now. Sure, it's okay. On the second stage. Right. You're more than welcome to go there. If at any time today you need to get up and move and leave. It's okay. Get up and no one gives a fuck. Right, it's okay. You can Stand move. Stand up like and some go. Some people have to be at the other panel, we understand. Yes, please go they to... They might the, be on the other panel. Yes. So nobody cares if you need... At the, we're in... You know, pretend this is... Yeah, you can, you can flow between one and the Please, other. Please, anytime. But we're going to start the startup pitches now. Okay. And then we're, we're, we're running a little behind, but we will catch up. We'll catch up. On the next session. The Got next it. session Did is... Do you want to play a clip? I do have a clip. You know what I want to do? What? Yeah. Um, this is a really fun clip, and you can't do this because you're an investor in these companies, but I have this clip, and this is a, a, the earnings call recently on Tesla had. <laughs> and one of the journalists asked Elon what... Um, about Uber and, you know, you guys play very friendly, but there is this potential long-term conflict conflict heading down the road, metaphorically, no pun intended, which is you're getting into self-driving cars, you got the self-driving cars, might Tesla eventually get into doing their own platform? Because Te Uber has said, we'll buy every self-driving Tesla they make, which would be beautiful. Um, so I want to play this clip for the audience here. We'll try and do it off on my phone here. First question, uh, Steve Jurvetson was recently uh, quoted saying that Uber CEO Travis Klanek told him that if by 2020 Tesla's cars are autonomous, that he want to buy all of them. Um, <laughs> is, is this a real, I mean, forget like the 2020 for a moment, but is this a real business opportunity for Tesla supplying cars to ride-sharing firms, or does Tesla just cut out the middleman and, and sell on-demand electric mobility yeah. services directly from the company on its own platform? Now listen to this awkward pause. That's an insightful question. You, you don't have to answer it. I, th I think, I don't think I... I don't think I should uh, answer it. Okay, wait, let's move on. All right, so um, that makes it pretty easy. Peter, um, when will you be competing directly with Uber? You have to ask Elon that question. <laughs> <laughs> He's not a trick. Um, it, it does seem like um, there's a great opportunity here, and obviously these guys are not going to be able to comment. Uber can't comment on either other than you're working on 
stuff as well. Can I say something? Case can comment on it, however. Can Go I ahead, say Case. something in general? Yeah, about in this. general about this when companies are all hovering around the same space. I can imagine this, this reaction of Elon, because if you are building a great product or a great company, you're not focusing on your competitors. Yeah. You're focusing on your customers. You want to build the best possible product for the future for your customers. And at the same time, you have all these trends. So if you're really yeah. into your own business and your customers to improve your business, you're not really having a very good strategy based on your competition behavior. Uh, so you really try to optimize for these customers because those customers buy your products and they churn or they retent right. with you. And so this so is you not say top the of your mind. pause is, you read into the pause something? I, I read into it that that was not a consideration, to my opinion, that this is done from a he competition perspective. It's done, you know, he's, he's, he's seeing mind. trends, he's yeah. seeing the future for his customer behavior. Yeah, that was my read on it, which was, I think, you know, like, if I comment on that, it's going to become a bigger thing than it is. We've got to deliver the Model X, which, speaking of, end of the third quarter is in the next 30 days. Um, what is the car, what do you think the response will be to the car? And, you know, will you guys hit this deadline? Uh, it feels like you guys have really, it feels like Elon set an incredible benchmark for this car. It's, it's a magnitude harder than the last one, or is it slightly harder, 20% harder? It is, um, it is a very, very challenging car to, to build. Um, because the doors? Um, because it, it has a whole bunch of new features, including the doors, um, that, uh, that really puts the organization on, on edge. But we've said we would deliver um, uh, in third quarter, and uh, you know, if Elon says that, that's going to happen. And we have to take a break. Oh, take a break. Okay. Before the next question, because we have to do the pitches. Oh, it's the pitches. But we have one other important thing is, but because there's somebody very important who wanted to watch the pitches. Okay. And that is um, the, the, one of the princes here, Prince Daniel, uh, wanted to join the event. You have princes and here? We have a king and a queen and princes. They still do That's that awesome. in Europe. Yeah, they it's do crazy. That. Okay. So um, there's. Uh, you know, Tyler, I, I'm known as the Prince of Brooklyn. <laughs> Technically speaking. So, but, but what we do in Sweden is when, when uh, the, the prince, prince is here, comes, he we, we have everybody stand up for a second because uh, Prince Daniel will join us momentarily to watch the pitches. Okay. So if everyone could please stand. Oh, very good. Wow. Welcome, amazing. Prince Daniel. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Welcome back. Yes, great to see you again. Yes. And you see I'm still working out. Yeah. <laughs> I have a funny joke. Last we had lunch at the castle. Wait, wait. The prince is going to sit in the front he's row. Why, why isn't the prince sit up here? We have a seat no, for you here, prince. No, no, no. He's gonna, no. It's yeah, very yeah. understated. But he prince he loves. He actually loves startups. He's a fan of startups. He is a big fan of startups. He helps really? promote startups across the country. Really? He goes to schools, meets with all the kids. Bring. He has an amazing delegation, to Daniel Leck and all. And they go and they talk to the students huh. to inspire entrepreneurship. He's himself, he's a former, he's an entrepreneur himself. Got it. Yeah, no, it's truly it. awesome. Very good. I, you have, I have a favorite a... app, Prince? What's your favorite app right now of the moment? Candy Crush? <laughs> what level are you on? No, seriously, what's your favorite app this year? A new app. You have a new app you like? Shapelink. Which, what do you say? Sh Shape Make? Shapelink. Shape Link. Shape, what is it? What does it do? Oh, fitness. Uh, he, see, he had, he had a this gym. This guy looks like he's in good shape. He's in great shape. And no, this is, so I go to I the. I thought as a prince, you don't have to work out. You just bring you food, or you he's hang out. He's in great it's easy. shape. No, so. Uh, if we, I'm the prince, I'm not working out. I know, nor, no, nor would I. So, but we go over to the. Uh, we, Does he, the prince get a castle? They have a castle here. You have a castle? Yes. What do you, can we go later? Yeah. <laughs> Could you after party? We have an after, after party, party the at the castle? Come on. You play poker? Come on. All right, that's it. We're all going back to the castle after this. All right, wait, like, no, say 10.30? All right, yeah. I'll see you there. He, he invited me over to the castle for, uh, to, for a meeting. Really? Uh, yes. What's it like, the castle? It, 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 honestly, it's not, a bridge. it's not that nice of a castle, actually. It's just a it's modest very, castle. <laughs> it's a very modest, it's very sweet. As far as very, castle goes, it's, it's beautiful, modest. but it's very modest. It's a modest yes. castle. It's, Under yes. 20 rooms. Uh, hang on. Under or over L 20 rooms. More, much more than 20 rooms. All right. Going to have a place to stay, right, Prince? It was, okay. okay. So he invites me over, and, uh, and I've been working out at the gym. You look great. I uh, Thanks. And he said the same thing. He goes, 
I'm wearing my jacket. And he goes, you look really good. You've been working out. I can tell you've been working out. And, he, you know, and I said, yeah. well, well, let me show you. And I take off my jacket. And really? he, he starts laughing. He goes, huh, let me show you. He goes, that's so American. <laughs> let me so show you. So then he took you. his jacket off. Yeah, yeah. So I take off my jacket. And then I go, and I look at him. And I'm, he has his jacket on. I go, you look really good, too. You've been working out. I think out you too. might want to stop the, the no, story. I know. And then he goes, he goes, yeah, yeah, let me show you. And he's like, jacket you know, off. But he didn't take the jacket off. Okay, all right. But then his... <laughs> His secretary says, well, I'm, is this a private lunch? I should leave you guys alone? Yeah, and, lock and the I, doors. And, yeah. Uh, and he's like, no, no, you should stay and be are impressed. You guys, so are we're you guys both, working out together now? Yeah, I, well. You have, you, have a, you have a gym at the castle? Anyway, but he, want, <laughs> okay. he wanted to come All and right. see Fantastic. the startup's pitch. And so I'm going to introduce the first startup. And this is for the panel as well. You All have right. the monitors down here. We have here. courtesy monitors. This is a new innovative company in the space of transportation. They showed, by the way, they showed this at the monthly event recently mm. with some very impressive people on the stage, and they got very, very excited. Uh, okay. And that's all I'm going to say about that. All right, here we go. Uh, so take it away, Peter. Are you ready? Yeah. Ship wallet. Thanks. Sorry for killing the, the royal party, party here, but I got to talk about a problem. Uh, so 70% of all e-commerce carts are abandoned, and that's a $4 trillion business getting lost in smoke. Um, and 50% of the problem is due to shipping-related issues. So let me, um, let me run a survey with you guys. How many of you actually feel that you're not in control over the shipping process when you shop online? That's every one. Um, so the problem here is choice. Because when I shop online and get these two choices, those are not personalized for me. How do they know how I want my shipping done. They don't. Second, getting the product from the shipper is really tricky, right? So this actually happened to me. I'm getting this product shipped. They send me a text message. Are you at home between 1 and 4 p.m. on a work day? Um, I go like, what the fuck? I am at work. And they ship it back to the hub. So I have to go to Arlanda to, to get the product, right? Not working. Um, so. I'm not very pessimistic about e-commerce anyway, because it's growing like crazy. And by 2019, it's going to be 450 billion euros in revenue in just Europe. Right? But if we zoom in on the problem, which is that 30% of you guys abandon a cart because of lack of relevant shipping options, that means 100 billion, whoops, 100 billion euros in lost revenue left on the table for the merchant. So how do we fix this problem? Um, one idea would be to do this, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so what we've done, and I'm going to demo this to you, is that we have applied that particular Klarna slipstream principle of the checkout to shipping. So here I am, shopping on Swedish has -beens. Klarna loads. And so does my ship wallet app or widget. This is a personalized shipping option for me. I'm like, yeah, this is what I need. And I go, boom. <laughs> but what did actually happen here? So let, let's go back and see. That data, which was pre-entered because I'm already a Klarna client, got passed on to our ship wallet algorithm that calculated the best shipping option for you out of hundreds of shipping options which we've integrated. And for you guys who, um, oh yeah, and this is based on metrics, right? So you wonder what metrics do we use? We use metrics like how do you shop, your past behavior, what do your neighbors do when they shop? Because maybe there is a shipping option in the, your neighborhood that's the best for you. And this particular product, what shipping options do people use when uh, they shop shoes? <laughs> and of course, how the merchant performs. So for you guys who want to make your own selection, you can open the, the widget like this. You can select your pickup location, go to home delivery options, and you're set. All right, going back to the presentation. Yep, and of course, we have an app. So all the purchases you do will be tracked for you in our app very, very transparently in one place. Cross-merchant, cross-shipper, cross-border. 
And how many of you guys have problems with returns lately? It's not that frictionless. You put that hand in the air. Uh, we have an app for that now, because you can just hit that button and make a return directly in the app. So enough talk about uh, consumers, because this is fixing a big problem for consumers, but also for merchants, because we built this platform to increase conversion for them. And through one simple integration in our dashboard, you get access to tons of different shipping options. And if you don't have the contract with the shippers, don't worry, because we got the contract. You can, we can hook you up. So who wins? I think this is a triple win. Consumers win because it's going to be so much easier to shop online. And merchants win because they get more conversion. And shippers, they get a bigger market and they get access to consumers. They don't have that today. We intend to grow really fast. We're already starting now in September with some of the biggest Swedish fashion labels. Odd Molly and Swedish Haspings are, are the first to go. Then we grow to platforms, eventually into different countries in Europe. And by 2017, we plan to hit the 30 million shipments landmark. Our team is very strong. We have combined 50 years of e-commerce experience and shipping logistics experience in the team. And we know how to make ship fly, believe me. Uh, so if you share ShipWallet's vision that shipping is the last battle of e-commerce, join us on our website, uh, sign up before ship hits the fan. Okay. <laughs> hey, I got a, I got a small uh, announcement to make. Okay. Uh, my colleagues are in the, uh, in the audience, and we have a demo table. And we also have a chat online on ShipWallet. I want to hear your worst shipping story. The worst shipping story is going to get this awesome long sleeve T-shirt with our logo on. Awesome. Cool. Nicholas mm. Ustberg. Yeah. Ustberg? Ustberg. Ustberg. <laughs> Ustberg. Something like that. No, yeah. keep going. Let's try one Ustberg. more time. Ustberg. Yeah. Perfect. All right. I'm going to get there. Um, you're in shipping. Yeah. Um, what do you think of what you saw from ShipWallet? What do you think their challenges will be? I, I think it was a fantastic pitch, really good. I, I, I like the product, I like all. I think it's, 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 I know, it's going to be a massive industry. I don't know, we see more and more, we start delivering coffee. Um, so you see that more and more people actually want to get delivered and want to get it delivered very fast. So as we see more like self-driving cars, we see we expand into delivery, real-time delivery when we want to deliver something really fast. People just want to have everything delivered. I don't know, people don't want to go out, they don't want to do the hassle and so on. So, so the whole delivery space will be huge. Who will win? I don't know. Uh, will it be that, I don't know, will it be one of these guys? Will it be us? Will it be um, well, someone? Well, you said you want to do but, Postmates. But so I think, I would think you the, integrate your product into his where like, you could check out and I, I you, would have you to think how it would here. work for yeah. us. But I, I, I don't know, in general, just the, the, the way with the whole industry is going with delivery is just completely changing. I don't know, whatever we see today is just going to be nothing what it's been tomorrow. So there'll be so many startups finding a niche, finding a place, finding uh, so much money to be made in this industry of delivery. Um, and, and I don't know, the early out in the space and uh, how to find a way of actually taking part of that huge industry that's coming. So uh, exactly how does this work out and, and uh, the whole execution and so on, that's all to be seen and to come, Good. but it's a huge industry. Joe, what did you think? As a consumer, I loved it. I have the exact same shipping stories of them trying to deliver while I'm at work. Mm. Um, and I think it, yeah, it's awesome. It's moving to this world of you being able to get anything you want from your, your mobile phone. I would imagine that the, the challenges will be on the um, vendor side. So they then have to integrate with more different shipping options if you're going to offer those to the consumer than they do at the moment. Because presumably most of them deal with one shipping provider and now would have to find a way of, of integrating with all the ones that, that you offer. But, but so I think the merchant achievable. doesn't have to deal with any of these shippers. You just are the complete outsourced shipping solution. The, the merchant can use their own shipping uh, contracts, but they will not have all the shippers and definitely not all the new ones that are coming out. Got so it. we get, get them covered on the long tail. It's like Twilio for shipping in a way. It's like yeah, an API-based like shipping, like Stripe shipping for shipping. Gateway. Basically a shipping from, gateway. Yeah. Now, the delivery to locations there, is that your business or does that exist through somebody else? No, that's... The ones I showed you were exist, are existing in the shipping companies already. Like, we're using their APIs and getting, getting the location. So if a small company doesn't want to spend months and months and months setting up all these shipping options, mm. they can just plug in your API. Correct. It's and amazing. And Peter, the, widget, what do you think? the widget is a simple JavaScript implementation, basically the same way as Klarna, so they're already used to it. Got it. Yeah. Peter, what do you think? 
Well, um, most of most of the stuff that that my family is, is buying online today, we do on on Amazon. And, Amazon and, Prime. And, and we use Amazon Prime. So yeah. my perception is that we already have that service for for most of the stuff that we're we're buying. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I think that's. Um, that's really the market leader, and I think there is a big market for similar type of, of experiences. Yeah. That is, uh, answer the Amazon Prime question, because yeah. it does seem like those users are particularly loyal. I will pay more mm. for a product on Amazon just to deal with how simple it is and well, how you know, returns are so simple and everything is so simple. How do you deal with the Amazon Prime issue? Yeah, well... I don't want to let you in on too many, um, you know, strategy details, but the end goal or the end game could be for us to actually charge you a, a monthly fee and you get free shipping on all merchants, right? Okay. That's an incredible idea. Yeah. You should not let anybody know about it. No. <laughs> should keep that secret. Um, Case, uh, what do you think of this business? You work or you're, you've joined a venture firm that doesn't exist. Would that firm like to take a non-existent meeting with this company? And has it taken a meeting with this company yet? A non-existent meeting, a virtual <laughs> meeting. Uh, I think we would like to have a meeting. Everybody knows that the biggest hurdle in, in getting all the retail online, where only 10% is online now, is to deliver the stuff at home. And if it's not good, to bring it back. Um, so I think the, the customer pain is obvious. Everybody knows it, and it has to be solved. Um, at the same time, I think if you want to solve it, you have to come up with the real innovations. And I would like to know more about the real but products. But you're a growth person. Yes. This company is not in the growth phase yet. You're in the product market phase. Would you meet with them even though you probably wouldn't invest at this time? Or are you guys going to make speculative investments? We know this is an area that will be developed, so we'll take meetings. Uh, we will not invest in this phase in this kind of companies, but we will monitor them closely because this is a consumer pain that will be solved by so somebody. So you let the angels invest first, but you yeah. want to monitor it now. And if you want my honest opinion about this, I think the biggest challenge you have, uh, you have a great proposition, but then you show a slide with only a traditional transportation companies. So I would like to know more about how you're really going to solve this problem. Because if you... Uh, if you go with the current players in the field that cause all the problems, the question is how are you really going to solve it? Well, all right. the, the, Quickly. The, the, the shipping companies have problems in the first mile and the last mile. The middle mile is pretty optimized, right? So, UPS, uh, FedEx. Yeah. So what we're, we're going to be seeing is like you guys making the last mile more effect, effective and there's somebody who's going to make the first mile more effective. But still, I think shipping companies with their enormous networks are going to be sitting there in the middle. How many customers, transactions, revenue, whatever metric case, does he need to hit for you to invest? What would be the so, benchmark so, for where you guys would invest? So as you know, we have very good relationships with all the tier one VCs in the US. Uh, and if you look at them, all the big successes they had, they were involved quite early. Why? Because by the time you have the inflection point and you want to grow your company, you have to know the people behind the ID. So uh, if you can prove that this works, you have some customers, you get some traction, and you can make a positive unit metrics out of those deliveries, we so will it could be, be interested to talk. It could just be 1,000 deliveries a month, but if the unit economics were solid, you're interested. Or if we can see the unit metrics is going to work, and this is going to right. bring the solution, yes. Let's hear it for Ship Wallet. Big round of applause. Thanks. All right, let's keep the train moving. What are these guys got, four minutes? Yep. All right. We got to keep them. Four minutes, and then we hit the buzzer. Yeah. Okay, go. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hey. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. We all have too many cards. They are everywhere. Our houses and our wallets are exploding with them. With Fidesmo, you only need one. The Fidesmo card holds your home key, your hotel key, your city bike access, your gym card, and of course, your public transit tickets. Door to door with one card. 
Fidesmo facilitates for the modern traveler by offering efficient access to different means of travel and lodging. So adding content and value to your Fidesmo card is as easy as tapping it to your phone. Imagine uh, concert tickets, transit tickets, hotel keys, and uh, sport events just by tapping your phone to the card. And our backend connects to any device. So today it's a card, but tomorrow it's a phone, it's a watch, it's a bracelet, who knows? It is in use today by Tripoli and Sunfleet. And today you can come by our table to get a free Fidesmo card and a free subscription with Sunfleet car sharing. So only today, come by our booth and get the offer. Thanks. Okay, that's an efficient presentation if there ever was one. Um, Nicholas, what did you think? So, so I, I, I like the idea, I like it a lot. Uh, that's what I want to have. At the same time, you're fighting many battles against many people who want to be in the space, who wants to have their card and wants to have their thing. But eventually that monopoly or those monopolies will have to break. So, so I, I, I don't know, that's how it should be. And it doesn't make any sense to have all those cars. It should be able to do it better, phone, and so on. What solution is, I don't know. If there's these guys, or something else. But it cannot be as it is today. So I agree on the problem. And, and the question is, who's going to solve it in this way? So this is really good to summarize. How long will we have these cards? Right? Because you're a bridge technology to consolidate the cards. How long do you think the cards will be with us before this all becomes, you know, Apple Watch, Passbook, yeah. whatever? So I think that the cards will always exist, Why? but they will exist at the same time as the watch and as ah. the phone and as everything else. I think the cards do have some you know, uh, good things with them. I mean, they, they are pretty durable. I can drop them in the ground. I can have them well, in my... Try dropping the phone. Let's see what happens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can forget them in the, in the washing machine or something like yeah, that. Yeah. And, and they're very cheap. I mean, if you compare it to, to a phone or an Apple watch or something like that. So they do have some merits. And the battery doesn't die. And the battery, that's exactly. That so might can, be the biggest feature. Yeah, it, it might be. So um, I think they will always be around. Then the question is, you know, now they're almost, I don't know, 100% of it, right? And uh, what percentage they will be, I don't know. Got it. Joe, what did you, okay, you want to... And, and, and then the question is, how do these other guys want to add up to your service? Because, I don't know, of course, Apple Pay wanted to also be the payment provider and want to have the phone there. Uh, Miles and more want you to go into the app and, and use the app. So, so, and if you integrate, how, how to keep them happy? And, and Obviously, <laughs> that's an issue. But, I mean, what we want to be is to be basically a thin layer that can, can connect all these companies to... Uh, one piece of you know um, technology that that can sort of authenticate you uh, at the time of purchase or when you want to get into a room or something like that. So if you're in a hotel, maybe the only thing you see is an URL in the uh, in the bottom of your booking reservation. You click that, you open up the app, and you, and you sort of transfer the ticket, and that's it. You're never sort of otherwise inside our app. It's just a feature and how to deliver that ticket, but it's still you know, the booking site that keeps the Joe, you had a few feedback? So I, I love the, the concept and I agree on the, the problem. I guess as the consumer, I don't quite see the difference or the extra value proposition beyond Passbook, Apple Pay, things like that. I'm always going to leave the phone with my, leave the house with my mobile phone and that will do most of them, won't it? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I Peter? mean, I, I think, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely get the card. I think the, I think it's an incredibly difficult um, area to get into because you know everybody wants to use their cards to communicate with their customers and surely don't want, even if it's a slight filter between them and the customers. Let me ask a question. Does anybody out there use Passbook? Raise your hand if you've used Passbook this year. That's fascinating. It's about half the audience. It's getting pretty popular. Has anybody used Passbook for anything other than an airline ticket? And that's about half of the half. So people have used it for some other purposes. I've never used it. For, what have you used it for other than an airline, Joe? Um, loyalty cards on hotels and things oh, like yeah? that. Oh, yeah? Oh, okay. I didn't know that was the case. Okay, great. I Box just case? want to... Can I comment yeah, a little bit on what you said uh, yeah. regarding that everyone wants to have their own card in your pocket? And I think that, yes, they want that. But at the same time, it's more important for them that... Uh, 
you know, people actually use their service. So in many cases, if, especially if it's services that you don't use on a daily basis, something like that, you throw out the card and you don't have them in your wallet. And then it's better for them if you actually use the service than that they you know, have a card with their branding, but you, you don't see it anyway. So I think that's where they come from. I do agree with you, but I think you have a, a bit of a convincing to do with a lot of companies. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's almost as crazy as trying to take on the car industry. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> yeah, I always love it when like the entrepreneurs who like took on the biggest, hardest incumbents yeah. tell the other entrepreneurs, it's going to be pretty hard. Uh, he knows what he's talking about, though. <laughs> I, I, I want to add one more thing there. And I think you love your uh, Tesla? Uh, uh, I love my Tesla. <laughs> that's always a good lead. Yeah. Uh, and that's that a lot of these, uh, I mean, uh, organizations that are distributing a lot of cars, I mean, they're public transport operators and something like that. And they do see that this is a huge cost for them. And they, they do ask themselves, why do I spend millions of, of crowns or, or dollars on this just to get the card out there? Because for them, it's not the major branding do issue. Do you get paid by them to get people to acquire a card? Would they yeah. pay you a dollar to get, get a card on the card? Yeah, to get on the card, yeah. So you could just say to them, hey, we have 10,000 cards. Would you like us to offer your loyalty program to these 10,000? And we'll take a dollar every time they turn on. So you have a built-in business model. Exactly. That's the business model. It is the business model, I guess. <laughs> one of them. One there of them. There are many. It's a really good one. Uh, Case, thoughts quickly? Yeah, I think for me, it's just like for yourself. With most of the e-commerce companies you're involved with, payment is an issue and it's a challenge. But there's a huge amount of players that already have substance uh, that are trying all to solve the same problem. For me, this would be way too early to spend time on. You know, I would refer you to some angel investors to work more in your ID, to, to make it a bit more concrete. What does it really is? How does it work? Uh, do the consumers love it? Do the suppliers benefit from it? Yep. So for me, it would be way too early. Okay. Cool. Let's hear it for Fedissimo. Cool. Okay. Done. So we have. We're done. Yep. Yeah. Almost. Okay. So some some wrapping up on this session here, and yeah. we did we did run a little bit long, which for you and me is normal because right. Americans love it when stuff goes long. Yeah, of course. For Swedes, it drives them a little crazy. They're a little so out. we will catch up uh, before lunch breaks out, and. The, we now are going to let the audience vote which of the two startups wins a Viaplay three-month free subscription. Compliments of Viaplay. All the startups on stage are going to be competing during each session for three months of Viaplay. So raise your hand if the winner should be Ship Wallet. And raise your hand if the winner should be Fidesmo. All right, Ship Wallet. So congratulations to Ship Wallet. Well done. And All right, let's it, thank Joe, yes. uh, Case, Nicholas, yes. and Peter. What an amazing panel. They were so yeah. honest. And, yeah. and, and by the way, Peter, um, Peter came from L.A., Joe came from London. Wow. Case is all over, Amsterdam, and, and you have the guys from Berlin coming finally to the event. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for coming to the event. Oh. Everyone came from all over to make this panel happen. Let's hear it one more time so for this amazing panel. Yeah. Well done.